I'm Thierry Bastian. I'm software developer for uh, Nokia, Qt Software. I've been working for them for two years now, and I moved to Oslo for that. Uh, I'm currently a member of the widget team, so my area of competence is uh, around the main window, uh, toolbars, but I'm also, of course, working on the multimedia framework primarily, so I've been working mostly with uh, the, the Windows backend, so Direct Show, and uh, together with uh, the other guys on the, on the other platforms. Um, besides that, I'm also working on the animation API that should make it into 4.6, and there is another presentation about this tomorrow. So now the, the contents of this presentation. Uh, first, I will talk a little bit about uh, what is our multimedia framework, what are the goals, and so on. Then I'll show you a little bit the architecture, how it works, with some examples, and the main classes that you have in, in Fallon when you want to actually do some multimedia in your application or integrate multimedia in your application. And then I end up with um, future plans. Uh, I talk about future because it's not planned yet. So we have ideas of what we want to add in the future, but we don't know exactly uh, when we're going to, to add them. It also depends on you, and it also, of course, depends on what we want to do, because um, we need to focus on sometimes different projects, and so we have to decide uh, what are the more, most important. So first, uh, what is our multimedia framework? Um, we don't want to re-implement the wheel. So we don't want to redo the wheel and we have um, something that works on top of the low-level API. So it's just a multimedia layer basically for integration of, for example, Direct Show on Windows, uh, QuickTime on, on, uh, on Mac and GStreamer on Linux. So the goal is still the same for any Qt API. It has to be simple to use uh, very easy to understand, but it also has to provide you with uh, with good flexibility and and uh, all the things you need to do multimedia today. So you need to have network transparency, so that you can, for example, load something over the internet very easily, and you need to have threat transparency, because usually when you have multimedia contents or when you watch a video, for example, all the things that happen behind the scene like decoding the frames, even sometimes drawing the frames, they, ha they happen in a different thread. And that should be completely transparent to the users, so completely transparent to the developer. Um, Feature-wise, we also want to add uh, the, the basic multimedia controls, of course, so like being able to, to play a video, being able to pause it, or just see it into it, know when it's ended, uh, what are the, the um, metadata, and so on. It also has to be very efficient because we know that decoding a video is something that's already very uh, hardware intensive and we don't want to bother the CPU with uh, all additional CPU cycles just because we add the layer. So it should be really something simple that adds on top of what you already have on your system and that uh, allow you to, to control uh, the, the, the playback of uh, a video or sound, for example. So actually the, the name of this framework is also known as Phonon um, because it's not a framework that we developed in Trolltech, it's a framework that was developed for KD, KD4 in this case. So it's part of the, the KD libs. Uh, one, different, one difference from um, all the other libs that are in KD is that it's only dependent on Qt. Uh, we made this because we wanted to, to work with them and we wanted to integrate Phonon into Qt or to at least ship Phonon with Qt and for that we needed the dependency to only be on Qt and not on the KDE libs because we don't want to uh, have to ship all the KDE libs. So it's really the, the first time also we collaborate uh, this way with the, the KDE people because we uh, participated in designing the API and in the implementation. And so, so the first time that we directly integrate something coming from the community, from the KDE community in this case, um, to be a, a part of Qt with a Qt-based API directly usable by our users. Uh, just one word about licensing. Uh, as the rest of KDE, 
for most of KDE. Phonon is actually LGPL. And all the, the backends, all the things that we added to, to Phonon are, um, belong to the KDE community. And so the, the, the license of them is also LGPL. So this means that it's not like GPL where you cannot do closed source um, development. You still can do that. You can do closed source, open source, no problem. But the thing is that um, in the case of LGPL, freedom is not an option. So if you have, if you use Phonon, you need, and you, if you provide a closed source application, you need a way to actually update Phonon because Phonon itself is LGPL. That's also why, one of the reasons why Phonon uh, will by default be built as a, as, a, as a separate library because having it as a separate library will not uh, force you to, to provide the source code it will just um, <coughs> give you the ability to update Phonon on its own without actually touching your application. So now let's talk a little bit about the architecture, how it actually works. So I have this um, little image. Uh, so basically you have two parts in Phonon. One is the front end, so it's really uh, the API that, uh, that people will use. So you have all the classes there that you use from your Qt application. It completely abstracts the, the, the playback engines that you have at the bottom. So at the bottom you can see that you have uh, all the backends that are implemented and that we support that we developed at Trolltech in uh, collaboration with the, with the community. So we have three of them. We have the director one, which I did. We have the QuickTime one for macOS, and you have the Dreamer one for Linux and for embedded Linux. Um, by the way, the director one uh, was primarily done to work on, on Windows. So it uses um, the latest versions of DirectO, DirectO 9, you can use Direct3D as well, but it also works on, uh, on Windows Mobile so, uh, and, and Windows CE. So if, if on Windows CE and Windows Mobile you have DirectO, you will be able also to use DirectO and you will be able to, to, um, to use multimedia, so this multimedia framework into your application. Um, <coughs> From the point of view of, of the developer or the, the maybe the packager, uh, Phonon itself is just a library like Qt GUI, like Qt Core. So it's just a DLL or a shared library. And uh, the backend themselves, they are also libraries, but they are loaded as plugins. So like Qt plugins, like you have, for example, for the, the image formats. So once you use Phonon, the front end, the front end will try to load the back end. So now if we go a little bit more into details about the, the, the concept. So you have basically um, three types of nodes. Why do we have nodes is that um, to separate the different duty of, uh, of a multimedia stream, you have all the things that happen in a graph. And so every node in the graph has a certain duty. So when you have, as I said, three types of nodes. One is the source node. This is the one that feeds data. So in the example where you would just play back an MP3 file, it would just be uh, a box that would read from your file and feed the data into, into the, the pipeline. Uh, then this data comes to a processor, for example, and the processor node is a node that's in charge of transforming data. So in the case of an MP3, again, you would have your source that would be reading your MP3 file. The processor file could be just a decoder, so it knows how MP3 works and it just decodes it into um, sound data that you can directly play on your sync node, which is the endpoint. So the, the, the sync node in our case could be just your uh, sound card. So in this case you would just have something that reads your MP3, something that decodes it, and then you stream it back to your, to your sound card. So you just happen to, to, to read your mp3 file with those three, three nodes. Um, and the, the connections, as I, I mentioned before, the connections between those nodes, they have a direction and uh, they actually represent the data flow that happens. So, <coughs> so in our case, I said, 
Um, we have the concept of graph in Fornon. It's not explicit, it's implicit, so that every time you connect nodes between them, you actually uh, implicitly say that they should be in the same graph, because a node can only be in one graph. Um, by default, or actually, all nodes, all nodes are synchronized, so that um, they will not run on their own. There is a mechanism, usually handled by the backend or by low-level APIs, that will allow them to just be synchronized, so that, for example, if you have something that reads your file, it will not try to read the file in a whole thing and then, and then uh, put it in shared memory and try to put it to the, um, to the decoder. Actually, the, the sync will usually decide when it needs data. So in our case of MP3 reading, the sync um, actually defines the speed at which the data has to be read because uh, you need, for example, 44,000 samples per second on, uh, on your sound card because it needs to read at a certain speed. So this will define the speed for the, for the decoder and then the decoder will also define the speed for the, the, the file reader. A uh, little word about deployment. Um, um, as I said before, Phonon is only supported as a dynamic library, um, basically because of, of uh, license restrictions. We're also considering uh, adding support for static library, but you have really to be sure that uh, your application is compliant with uh, the LDPL. So basically, when you want to package a, a Qt Phonon application, what you usually need is, of course, Qt Core and Qt GUI that's to have access to your widget, so that's something you always need for your applications. Uh, you might need uh, Qt OpenGL because some of the backends actually also use OpenGL to draw on the um, to draw the, the video frames. So that really depends on your backend. You can of course, if you've defined that your whole Qt when you build it don't use, doesn't use OpenGL, then you don't have to package it. Apart from that, you also need to, to package Phonon itself the phone on backend, so the phone on backend has to go in a directory, in a special directory. You can have a look at the, at the documentation, I'm just uh, summarizing it. Uh, one thing I want to stress out as well is that you might need to, to bundle additional codecs because phone is just a multimedia layer on top of what you have on your system. We don't provide codecs, we just use the ones that are on the system. That means that um, there is no cross-platform codecs available on your machine. Uh, if you, you want to play sound, for example, your best bet is probably to go with MP3, but you will never be sure that the MP3 decoder actually exists on, on the target machine. It will be on Windows, it will be on Mac OS, and then on Linux you're not sure because some Linux distribution don't ship MP3 for uh, patent restrictions. So that's for sound. For sound, usually you can do, do that with, with MP3. For videos, it's uh, even worse because then maybe you can have um, an MPEG decoder, but you will never have MPEG2 decoder, MPEG4. On Windows, you have uh, Windows Media Video. So if you wanna, if you wanna play back MPEG4 or DivX or whatever, you will probably have either to be sure that it's already installed on the machine or uh, package it in your uh, deployment. So now let's talk a little bit uh, more concretely about what Phonon is about, uh, what are the main classes. So the first one, it's called media source. So the media source is not part of the graph that I described before, it's just a description of the source of your uh, media streaming. So in our case, a media source is just a simple object, value-based, so that you don't have to, to, uh, to allocate it on the heap. It's just something you create, like a Qstream, for example. And the source can then be a file, a URL. It could be a DVD, a CD. Uh, that's not yet implemented, but at least it's there in the API, so that you can uh, play back audio CD and DVD, even if it's not yet implemented in, in the backend. Um, you can also uh, stream anything from any QIO device. So it means that you have access to Q file, you have access to Q buffer. Uh, you will in the future also be able to use sockets. Uh, the reason why it's not yet there 
is that um, there is a concurrent issue, concurrency issue in the in the way that it's implemented today, and we have uh, threading issues with that. So it's not yet possible to use uh, uh, sockets. But what you can also do is that as you can use file, it means that you can actually uh, play from resources. This means that if you have, or if you are sure that, for example, you have an MP3 decoder, you can uh, just embed your MP3 inside the resource, so it will be inside your, um, your binary file, so inside just the .exe file on Windows, and you can uh, then play it back directly from your application, and you don't have additional files to, to deploy, just your, your application, your .exe file. And then I go to the path. So the path is an object. Again, it's value-based, like the media source. And the path is just there to, to represent a connection between two nodes. So if you have, like for example, a source and just a source and a sync, you will just uh, call phonon, column, column, create path with your source and your sync. And this will just create an object, uh, a path object. So <coughs> for every time you create a path, it returns a path object. You can, you can check if it's valid, and you should check if it's valid because sometimes the connection fails for some reason that you can then get back from another, another node. Um, then every, every node also keeps track of the path so that if you connect uh, the source to the sync, you can, you can get actually the, the access to those paths from the source or from the sync because you know what are the paths that are connected. And if you delete a node, it will automatically invalidate the path. So it's really, you don't have to, to worry about uh, what's happening behind the scene. It completely, it's completely consistent that when you create a path, it's either valid or not. And then if you, uh, you, you can disconnect this path, of course, so you can uh, specify that you don't want this link anymore, or if you remove one of the nodes, it will be automatically uh, disconnected and become invalid. So if you have kept track of it somewhere, you can just check its validity and is valid will just return false. Then the central object, really the most important one in, in, in Phonon is the media object. It really handles the playback of, of uh, any media source. It has access to all the data. So it, it has access, for example, to the, the metadata. It can tell you if uh, loading the source is actually possible. If something bad happens, the error will actually be, be, be put on that media object. So if something bad happens, you will get a message telling you that there was an error and you can get it from, from the media object. It also gives you control over uh, the, the playback. In, so you can uh, call play, pause, stop, seek. Everything is done on that media object. So it's really, really the central place. It can also handle queuing of more sources, so that if you have, um, I don't know, two songs or ten songs that you want to play in a row, you will just uh, uh, tell it to the media object to, to play one after the other. The reason why we have this queue handling in media object itself is that it can preload the next song, because uh, basically what you could do is that you could say that your media object just loads one song, and then when it's finished, you load the next one. But this will insert a gap. So we try to reduce the gap as much as possible on the back end, so that uh, you, if you read the first song, usually two seconds before the end, we'll try, to, we'll try to load the next one, so that we can start immediately when the first one is finished and, and really reduce that gap of, uh, of loading uh, a file. Then another node, which is the audio output. The audio output is uh, one of the sync in, in the graph, as I mentioned before. It's just a representation of, of your uh, audio device. It can be a virtual audio device if you have set that up in, in your system. Uh, the way you get access to the audio output is either you just create a simple audio output with new phonon, column, column audio output. Then in this case, um, you, it will just point to the default device. And you can also uh, bind it to a device that would be returned by, by Phonon. You, you have a way to actually query what are the, um, the, the audio devices that are available on your system. 
On it you also have, of course, simple controls like volume and mute. So in this example, it's just a really, really simple example with the, the, um, the smallest thing you can do. So I represented in blue the two nodes that are in the, the graph itself. So we have the media object and the audio output and the media object just needs a media source. So the way you would write the code is like that. So I just took a, a small empty application. So as I said, I would first create, I would first create a media object. So one thing you have to keep in mind also is that um, as not everything in, in, um, in Qt today, everything from phone on is a bit apart. So it's in a different library and it's also in a different namespace. So you also have this phone, phone on column column everywhere because you, you actually need it. So I create the media object and then I will create the audio output. output and then I will just create a path so I will call phonon create path between media and the audio so that really builds the graph you have the, the connection now you can load the source so if you have media source source and you can create it with any URL so in my case I will just take the argument from the, from the command line. Arguments. And then, of course, I can call play. I forgot. So usually, what I do when I when I um, when I implement a phone application or uh, when it's a small example, I use the using namespace uh, C++ feature that allows you to to avoid having phone on column column everywhere. But that uh, might uh, make you have mismatches because media object audio output. It might be something from coming from another application. So in this case, it builds. Uh, I will not show it to you because uh, this is just sound and it's not very interesting to have sound. We'll see later on with, with videos. So let's go back to this. So now I just add the video widget. So the video widget is finally what we need to, to play video. And um, it's also a sync, like the audio output. Uh, the big difference with the audio output is first you don't have to to live to bind it to any um, device and the second big difference is that it's a widget whereas all the other nodes are just your object this one is a widget of course because we want to display the the, um, the video somewhere so that you can just create this video widget and put it inside any layout and it will work out of the box you have basic controls for brightness contrast hue saturation um, and you also have uh, control for the aspect ratio and scaling so that you can say that you have to keep the aspect ratio or set it to uh, 4 third or 60 or 9 or something like that. Um, one thing which is a bit different from another widget is that by default it will use the, the, the system video renderer. For example on Windows it will use the video mixing renderer 9 which uses direct 3D 9 so this means also that it doesn't go through queue to actually draw the, the, the video frames. It also means that you cannot use the paint event on your queue widget to actually draw things on top of your video, for example. So if we go back to the, um, <coughs> to the graph. Um, from before, so now I only have added one video widget that, also, that is also linked to the media object. 
and that just works out of the box because you can uh, connect as many things in output as you want. So in the media object I can connect as many video widget or as many audio outputs as I want if of course the backend supports it. So here you just have a media object, video widget, audio output, media source. So in the, in the code what I will just do I will create my video widget And then I just create a path between again my media and video so that now I have set it up. Um, for clarity I just don't uh, check the, the, the return value of the create path but I said it creates a follow column column path so I could do something like uh, follow path p equals something like that and then I could check validity but I'm not doing it here because I know it works. <coughs> So in my case now, the only thing I want to do is I stop playing and I show my video. Okay, so as I said, you created your media object, you created the audio output, the video output, created the path, and now of course you have to also load the source because we just created it. And so you call set current source source on your media object. Now you can play and show the, the video and just execute the application. Mm -hmm. Now I just recompile, of course. It will take a few seconds and I can show you a video. Here you go. So just, just a simple example, um, this video was taken from the Microsoft website. They have, uh, they have examples with, uh, with HD videos running in, in Windows Media Video. So for this, for, for this example, for example, I didn't need to, to, uh, to add any codecs because it's Windows Media Video and I'm on Windows. So it just works out of the box. And it just resizes because by default you have, it keeps the aspect ratio. So one other node um, that is there is the audio effect. So the audio effect just uh, is a way of adding effects to the audio stream. Uh, it's one of the processor nodes and it's actually the only processor node we have so far. Um, so the audio effects are not something you can implement directly. It's just something we get from the backend. So we get from DirectShow, we get from QuickTime, we get from GStreamer because they are already there a way of getting of getting those audio effects and you can insert them in the, the, the sound rendering process. Um, so you can get access to that with uh, with a static function basically in in, um, in Fonal and it gives you access to, to all its parameters. So you can get the type of the parameter, you can get the minimum value, maximum value and usually default value. Sometimes when it's an enum it's just a list of strings so you can actually uh, uh, get this list of strings so that you can, for example, put them in a combo box or whatever. So you also have, as I mentioned before, you have uh, you have a class that we call backend capabilities. It's not exactly a class, actually, it's just a namespace. So this is the one that you would use to, to get information from the backend. So you can get all the audio devices, you can get the the, the available audio effects, and it's also something that will extend in the future so that um, if we add features like compressing, for example, you will have a list of, of codecs that are available for audio for video. And um, so this is really the, the namespace that we are going to use in, in, in the future. Now talking about the future, um, we, as I said, we have some ideas on, on what we want to do in the future. Um, from the beginning, we, we wanted Phonon to be extensible, so it's, it's really extensible by design. You can add functionality very easily, uh, or we can add functionality very easily. Uh, we can do it in three different ways. One is a complete existing classes. When we complete existing classes, um, on the front end, there are no virtual methods. 
So it's very easy and it's binary compatible. What we have to do on the back end is that we have interfaces with, um, yeah, of course, everything virtual because it's interfaces. So we'll have to add uh, additional interfaces, but that's only something we have to do and we have to care, to care about and, and not you as users. You will just get new functionality as it comes along. Uh, when the functionality is not there, we always try to, to make it uh, seem like it's, it's not uh, mandatory and it will silently fail or you, you would have a signal telling you that you don't have this specific functionality or you can actually test if a functionality exists. We can of course add new, completely new classes, uh, like if we have a video compressor, it could be a, a different class or it will probably be a, a new class. Uh, we also have another class that sits on top, more or less on top of media object, which is media controller. Uh, this one is there to, to add functionality uh, um, non-mandatory functionality, so optional functionality, to the media object. It's already supposed to be used for the, the audio CD part, for example, or for the DVD. So you can get access to this media controller, you just create it on top of your media object and you, you ask for it if it has support, for example, for, the, for titles, so, or if it has tracks on, a C, on an audio CD. Um, that's also where we, very, we are very happy with, uh, with the way that we design Phonon because basically it's a graph, so in a graph you can always add new nodes or, or add different ways of doing it and it always allows you for, for flexibility and that's exactly what we want. So one of the things we want to add is um, um, managing substream so that uh, if you have a video uh, with multiple audio you can actually choose which one you want to use. You can actually access uh, uh, information about them. So you can, you can know that in your video, you have maybe two video streams and three audio streams and, and with different, uh, different language support. So that's really something we, we want to add. Um, <coughs> we also want to have more information about really what is in input and output in general for every node so that you can get access to, uh, to metadata, not only information metadata, like if you have sound, you can have access to, to the title of the song or the album. We, can, we want also want to have technical information. Um, for example, on a video, you want to know what's the color depth, what's the format, what is the exact size of your video, what is the, the media type that's used. So this is really, we want to add more control of what's happening uh, in the input, in the output of every node, and we want to also have more information on what's happening when you connect a path, when you connect two nodes with a path. Because currently what's happening is that you have your media object and you have your audio output or video widget and you just connect the nodes, but you no, don't know exactly what's happening. Because of course the connection between the media object and the audio output uh, is about audio, because you want the audio to be linked to or stream, it ba stream back to, a, to a, an audio device. Whereas when it's a video widget, it's video, so it's just uh, video frames that will be streamed to your video renderer and, and, and that will actually go through uh, painting and, and, and be displayed on your screen. So it's something completely different and for now there is no way of, of getting those information. Uh, one thing we also want to add is overlay. As I mentioned before, when we render video, it uses the default renderer, so it doesn't go through the Qt Paint engine. This means that you don't, uh, you cannot, or you cannot easily at least uh, uh, draw things on top of your video frames. So if you have, even if you have a video frame that is a full screen, you cannot add visual feedback. For example, when you change the volume or when you change uh, um, the brightness or anything, you cannot have that. Um, so as I said, it's especially, especially useful uh, when, you're, when you're in full screen mode because you don't want to show uh, an, an additional widget somewhere that just gives you feedback. And, and you, your user probably wants this feedback. Um, another case of overlay, if you wanted to manage, for example, yourself um, subtitles, that's again something that you cannot do today. One thing that was asked uh, a lot of times uh, it's a bit more complex than the rest, it's adding capture. Uh, because for now we only have playback, so you can play back videos, audios, 
and people more and more would like to have capture so that you could uh, capture from sounds and capture from your webcam or, or any cameras that's linked to your, uh, to your computer. So that's also something we, we intend to do. We don't know yet how it will go. Uh, we have some work in research that's already started, so we'll see. It will probably new sources for, for the graph and new sources for the media object, most likely, because you will have uh, to, to, to get sound from your sound card and, and camera from your, uh, and video from your camera, for example. So, basically, uh, from the graph point of view, that's more or less how it would look like. So that if you just want to preview what you're, what you're capturing and you don't want to stream it back to a file, for example, you would just have your microphone or your sound card in input and it will be uh, uh, linked to an audio output and your webcam could be linked to a video widget. <coughs> so um, again, transcoding, because uh, what I showed just before just shows you preview of capture, that's um, one good thing, but it's not enough. You also want to be able to compress and stream it back to a file, for example, because the thing you capture, you actually want them or you, you want to save them somehow. So you need transcoding for that. You need to, to change basically the data format because you, you get raw, uh, raw video frames or, and, and raw audio data and you want to compress them. So this would add possibility to compress your content and, and choose a container. Container being AVI, which is pretty old now, AUG, whatever you, whatever you have on your system. And yeah, this is very, very, very important for, for capture. Of course, it could also be used uh, in, in other cases uh, where you want, for example, to, to just transcode one video into another type because uh, you have a device that only supports some codecs. So basically just to summarize a little bit what I just said is, uh, is this visual. So you have really, uh, you would have the source which would be uncoded and then you would get everything in, in the output file. It's probably a little bit more complex because usually what you have is that you have your source which is video or audio and then you encode it and then you have uh, to um, multiplex it into uh, any uh, format, like AVI for example, and then you output it into a file. So that's a little bit more elaborate example. Um, if, you have, if you want to have uh, video and sound, and at the same time you want to preview it, so that's what, how m most likely it would look like. It's a bit simplified of course, I, I removed the the encoders, but you will have your microphone and as I mentioned before, you can always uh, connect an output more than once. So in the case of the microphone, you have only one audio output, but you can connect it to the output file, probably through an encoder, and you can also uh, connect it to the audio output, so your sound card. So you can at the same time listen to it and record it into a file. Same thing for the video camera. You would then put it in the output file and at the same time to the video widget. So now I'm going to show more advanced usage, even if it was not in the agenda. So let's start. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, when we use the video renderer, it's usually, uh, let's start here. We, we always use the, the renderer from the, from the system. There is one case where we don't do that. And that's also where we show that we want to integrate as much as possible uh, phone or any framework into what's already existing in, in Qt. And in Qt 4.4, we introduced phone. Another thing we introduced was that you could have any widget on the graphics view. Uh, for, those who, for those who don't know graphics view, it's our canvas. So basically, you can put anything on top of it, any widget, and then you can transform it, having it uh, changing the opacity, and so on. And we really wanted to have uh, videos on the canvas. But of course, we cannot do that by using, the, um, by using the, the native renderer, because uh, we have to go through Qt's paint engine to do, to do that. So what we can do 
is that instead of directly showing our video we can just create a graphics scene and a graphics view graphics view which is of course dependent on the scene and on that scene we can just add widget which is our video widget and so very easily by just doing that it will know that uh, it has to use the, the, the Qt Paint engine because it has to be on the, um, on the, the viewport of it has to be displayed on the viewport of the scene so now and here you can see so this is just using graphics view so now you can you can really use um, it as a graphics item it is really a graphics item there is one problem though um, maybe you can see it no, maybe not the problem is that going through Qt Paint Engine you completely remove uh, hardware acceleration so in our case you can see that even on my uh, iHand laptop it uses 86 or 87 or even up to 90 percent of my CPU time compared to the, the media player demo which would use uh, maybe 15 or 20 percent and there is actually a way of fixing that because we didn't want to release something or, or show something that was uh, that was not really usable what you can do is very simple you want to have hardware acceleration so just use OpenGL so you can actually use OpenGL by just setting a viewport by setting a QGL widget on, on the view and this will then the, the phonon will know that uh, QGL widget I just added the thing so Phonon will know that we're actually using OpenGL. So first, drawing the, the drawing the pixel map will be much faster. But then we also added uh, uh, tricks to make it to make it faster, because um, we added even pixel shader that allows you to simply oops, to simply uh, transform the the video format. So in our case it's much much faster you can already see it here now we're down to 30 percent and before we were up to 90 percent so it's like four times faster the reason why it's faster is that uh, first drawing is very very fast resizing the video is very fast which is not in in, in full software and um, we also change the format because you get YUV data from from your decoder and changing it into RGB is pretty uh, CPU intensive so in this case we just do it on the GPU with pixel shaders and now you can also use transforms meaning an, an opacity so you can actually uh, flip it around move it around um, uh, rotate it scale it however you want it will be just blazingly fast because OpenGL is very fast uh, that's for example a, a video this video is uh, HD so it's uh, it's not full HD but it's 7 20p which is pretty decent so I have made another example which is basically just derived um, it's just derived from the, the embedded dialogues if you know the embedded dialogues it was a demo that was made for um, for the graphics view when we added widgets in the canvas or widgets in the graphics view or where you could have uh, different uh, dialogues and when you when you hover over the dialogues they will just uh, more or less pop out of your screen and so that's the demo 
So here I have four videos running at the same time on my simple machine. Everything works fine. And when you hover over it, we just change the opacity and we change the transform. So we can actually transform completely the video and, and move it around. So you can have you can have different things like picture in picture, you can do really, really cool stuff. And with the animation API that will be provided as a labs project, you could even imagine having something completely fancy. Of course, in this case, uh, even with OpenGL acceleration, um, I'm already taking nearly all the CPU time on my machine because it has to decode and the decoding of four videos, uh, HD videos at the same time, is pretty difficult to do even on, on, my, on my laptop. But it works. And so if you have different videos with different sizes, it will you, you can even imagine having more than more videos. You can imagine having uh, nearly a, a river of, of, uh, of uh, videos. And you could even have tricks that instead of playing it, you could just seek it from one second to the other. It would be just l less smooth, but probably uh, as impressive. And so you could just imagine whatever you can do, because uh, the media player, everybody does media players today. It's okay, you can, you can watch videos in full screen, but if you have other use cases where you want uh, different videos to interact with each other, like, uh, I don't know, the next Skype could do that, for example. You could have uh, video conferencing with more people, and then you could just choose where you want to put these videos coming from these different people inside, uh, inside that graphics view. And with uh, very little effort, you can do that, and you can have really cool uh, really cool videos running on your graphics view and have uh, fancy UIs. So that was it. So thanks for your attention.